Well, welcome everyone. We're so glad you joined us this afternoon and uh, we're to our Building Financial Power webinar. And this topic today is on lending and how to lower your interest and decrease your debt payments. And with us today, we have TBK Bank. We're very excited that they're here to join us to share their knowledge. And we have Oscar Farbadillo. He has served as a branch manager for TBK's Dallas Sherry Lane location for the last two years. And he's prior to joining TBK, he has spent his 20 year career in the financial service industry, serving consumers, small business and commercial clients in the DFW area. And then with him, Joining him is Brian Bender. Brian is an assistant vice president, senior lending officer with TBK Bank. And Brian has received his, received his BBA from the University of North Texas, has more than 20 years experience in the mortgage industry. He's well-versed in a variety of mortgage lending, including conforming and non-conforming, including uh, home equity, the FHA, and VA loans. Brian has past involvement with nonprofit housing resources, giving him experience and detailed knowledge of down payment assistance programs and first time home buyer loan programs, which is very powerful. We try and talk about that a lot, Brian, and detailed home buyer education programs. So I'll kick it over to you guys, take it away, and tell us everything you want to share. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Brenda. Uh, so guys, we're, we're going to do a brief overview of kind of lending in general for banking, and then I'm going to turn it over to uh, Brian to kind of do a deep dive and uh, have a little bit more focus about mortgage. Uh, we're going to talk the types of loans you guys can qualify for, how to prepare for that, because sometimes, you know, you could start even preparing for a mortgage uh, a year in advance, Absolutely. and then some of the do's and don'ts, so kind of how to stay out of trouble, especially after you've been pre-approved. Uh, so we'll kind of touch on uh, types of bank loans and just depending on where you're at in your um, credit journey, there's uh, unsecured loans, which are credit cards, personal lines of credit, or personal loans through the bank. Um, also, if you're uh, looking at building credit, there's cash secured loans. So if you opened up a savings account and you needed to build credit, a lot of times banks can help you uh, get started with a loan that way. For example, you can put $500 in a savings account, and we would hold that, and we would lend you $500. And then you build payment history, you pay us back over, and uh, Brian will touch on that in, in the next couple of slides, how it might help you qualify, depending where you are. Um, of course, auto loans, mortgage loans, we're all kind of familiar with that. And then if for anyone looking to start a business, we also have lines of credit, commercial real estate, uh, and some more, I guess, uh, detailed loans, depending on the type of business you have. Um, qualifying factors, uh, you know, once you submit an application, the things a bank will look like, uh, or look at, excuse me, uh, credit score and credit history. So even though you might have a good credit score, there might be some things on your history that the bank might have some questions about and loan officer might, uh, have to ask you to provide some detailed information about that. Also, we look at total available credit and Brian will touch on that. Really, we look at, uh, your total borrowing power. So before we lend you, uh, any money. We like to look at how much access you already have to it. And of course, your work history, your income, how much your current debt payments are, and of course, how much down payment you're looking at. Can I jump in real quick? Absolutely. So back to the top of the credit score. Uh, one thing that I would tell you is, and this creates a lot of confusion, uh, there are nine different varieties of credit scores. And invariably, when I get a client, they expect their score to be 800, let's say, and I get it and it's 750. Both are really good, but they wanna know why, why if they go to LifeLock or whatever they use, why is it showing 800 and I have a 750? Well, the truth is there's nine different depths of credit reports. And depending on what depth, obviously in the mortgage industry, we take the deepest dive there is a consumer perspective. So we're going to look deeper than anybody else. And therefore, typically our scores run a, a little bit lower than what you'll find on a, a credit site. Um, so it's important to understand why credit scores vary. And as Oscar touched on, credit history is a huge part of that. So albeit you may have a great past, but if you had a major event, 
that being a foreclosure or a bankruptcy or whatever, that is going to follow you and affect that score. And that score dictates interest rates, which we will get into down here in a few slides. But I just wanted to really touch on the credit score and the fact that most consumers don't understand that there's nine varieties of those things. And so to get them to sync up is rare. And it, like for instance, if you're buying a car, they'll tell you your score is 800 and then you go get a mortgage the next week and the score is different. And that's the reason behind it is two totally different levels of score. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, good deal. Okay, yeah, so moving into this, this slide in terms of credit and the scoring, I can tell you the first two on moving left or right, those two anywhere below five, a, a 580, that in my opinion would require credit repair. And, and there's folks out there that specialize in that, companies that specialize in that, of course, there's a fee for that. But I can tell you from a mortgage perspective or a consumer lending pr perspective, anything really, frankly, below a 620, it's not going to get touched by Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac. Uh, so now FHA will, on a case-by-case -case situation, entertain loans with a credit score of a 580, but you have to have several compensating factors for that. Like, in other words, if you have a 580 but had a major medical event, then they'll consider it, but a case by case thing. So I typically make the parameter be 620 or better. And if you're below a 620, we need to look at what we can do to help improve your credit. And as Oscar touched on too, sometimes it's just building credit. Some, some folks credit profile is so thin that their score's low. It's not because they've done anything bad. They just don't have a lot of credit and therefore their score's low. So we can help with that. that that's an easy fix. Um, but once you get above 620, you're golden, and, and, and then it really, your, your score dictates interest rate. Like, for instance, if you had a 620, you're not going to get the same interest rate that somebody that has an 800 credit score. If There's going to be a, a variance of probably three-eighths to half a point just because of, of rate, and that's a big deal on a mortgage, especially a larger size mortgage, a half a point's a big deal. So credit score... Good credit does absolutely benefit you. And, and this is a nice scale to show you from low to high. So half a point, could that impact them 50 to $100 per month in there? Absolutely. Half a point could easily impact, I mean, any like a $300,000, $400,000 loan, that, that's probably $200 a month. Uh, so it's real money, you know? And if you look at that, uh, average over a 30-year term, that's about tens of thousands of dollars. So it's important to be 30 years, but still, you know, seven to 10 years is the average shelf life. And you look at half a point over 10 years, 120 months, it's a lot of money, a lot of money. So definitely want to pay attention to that. So uh, next slide, we're going to talk about types of mortgage loans. Um, moving left to right again. FHA, we do, these are all, the FHA and the VA are both governmental programs. I would tell you FHA, when I got in the industry, FHA was the go-to for first-time home buyers. No question about it. Today, I would not say that. And, and the reason behind it is because, I don't know if anybody's familiar with mortgage insurance, but mortgage insurance is a requirement if you put less than 20% down on a, on a mortgage. FHA requires mortgage insurance for the life of the loan. In other words, if you're getting an FHA loan and you put 20% down, you're still getting mortgage insurance. And that's an expense you don't need to pay if you don't have to. So uh, conventional loans, Fannie Freddie loans, when you say conventional, that's the same thing as Fannie Mae Freddie Mac. They came out about 10 years ago with a first time home buyer product to compete with FHA. And the, the benefit with FHA was you could put a minimum down payment, which was three and a half percent. Well, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac came out with a three percent. So they, it's a half a point less of a down payment. And you can get out from underneath the mortgage insurance once you have a 20 percent equity position 
And that could be through paying the mortgage down through the appreciation of the property or a combination of the two. So definitely, I always lean towards conventional financing unless you've got a, a credit score below 620, then FHA is your only option. Uh, so that's just, you know, food for thought there. And then of course, VA is our veterans loan. You would have to have been a veteran to qualify for a VA loan. And then underneath that, that bullet point of specialty programs, that, that has to do with, let's say USDA. And, and you may not have heard of that, or you may think that's the, uh, the produce or the, the, you know, the uh, butchers, U USDA type loan, right? You hear about that in food more than you hear about it in anything. Well, that's what it's tied to. It's tied to farmland. And so a USDA loan is not applicable to anything other than a rural property that has 10 acres or more, and it's operating at some fashion as a farm. But if, if you were to be interested in a property like that, then there are specialty loans out there for you in those cases but not really used a whole lot. Brian, how about for first responders? I know some cities have special programs for teachers to buy. Oh, good point. Insurance. Really good point, Oscar. Um, so first there, there are like down payment benefits to police officers, firemen, well, first responders, things like that. And what that offers is it offers them the ability to be treated as a first time home buyer albeit they may not be a first time home buyer, but they can still, get, they get a minimum down payment option. Um, and so that's the benefit to a uh, first responder or any other a teacher or anything like that is to make it as easy as possible for them to get into a home. And how the government looks at that is lowering the down payment requirement to ease them into that. So uh, those are the specialty programs occupation specific, but then I will also tell you county by county, uh, there are grant programs, which is, it's called a DPA, down payment assistance program. So let's take our conventional financing, first time home buyer with a 3% down payment. There, in certain counties, the, there's money earmarked for them to get that 3% down payment from the county. So in other words, through their mortgage and the down payment assistance, they're getting in the home with nothing out of pocket, which sounds fantastic. And it is, caveat being, you have to stay in that property for three years because these counties are basically saying, hey, in our county, if you'll buy a home in this specific area, we'll give you a grant, but you have to stay in that property for three years. If you move within three years, then you have to pay the grant back. If you stay there for three years, then it's forgiven. And the reason behind it, the, the spirit behind all that is to get people to move into their counties and to certain areas for, you know, it, transforming communities, if, if you will. It's to, it's to build up that residential mortgage base or the housing base and build up the people moving into that. You know, it's an enticement, if you will, to move to certain parts of counties. So, but it is a county by county uh, option. And you have to, you know, each home buyer would have to check within the county they're looking at to, to move forward or, or see if it's available. And then the last, last thing real quick on jumbo loans, the difference between a conventional and a jumbo, uh, the government right this year came out, raised the conforming loan limit up to 650. So as long as your loan amount is 650 or below, it's considered conforming, but anything above 650 is considered jumbo or non-conforming. And those, Underwriting guidelines are different. Interest rates are different. The whole thing's different on a jumbo. Does that make sense? Okay, good deal. So uh, moving on, how to apply. How to apply for a mortgage is what I'm gonna get into. Feel free to stop me if, uh, if you guys have any questions, but the what I'd like to go over is the do's and the don'ts for uh, applying. So I'm going to cover some of the do's and then we'll get to the don'ts. Um, first thing, the most important thing I can tell anybody that wants to get out and shop for a mortgage would be get pre-qualified first. Don't go find the property and get emotionally attached to the property and then apply because you're running the risk of 
maybe not qualifying for that. So you want to know what your purchasing power is prior to shopping. And I can tell you in this market, if you're not pre-qualified, you're, you're probably not going to get the house because they're not going to accept an offer from somebody. It's too hot of a market is what I'm really trying to say. So the, the, a seller won't risk uh, taking an offer from somebody that has, hasn't been vetted out by a bank up to that point. So pre-qualification, absolutely important. And go ahead. Yes, absolutely. I don't know if you heard Oscar, but he asked, is there a difference between pre-qualification and pre-approval? There is. Pre-qualification is something a loan officer can do for you by viewing your online application, running a credit uh, report, pulling all those numbers, running a debt to income ratio, all that. That's a pre-qualification letter. That's something I give to my clients when they go out and shop. A pre-approval is different. A pre Approval means I've vetted you out, but I've also collected all your documents, packaged it up, submitted it to an underwriter. A human underwriter has looked through everything and stamped it approved. So that a pre-approval has been approved by an underwriter. A pre-qualification means a loan officer has run the traps and based on some verbal information and your credit report has said, yeah, based on everything so far, this checks out. Here's your letter. Go shop. Does that make sense between pre-qualification and pre-approval? Okay. Um, so next bullet point, saving money. I can't stress this enough, how important that is to save money if you're in, in the housing market. And the reason behind it, it's not just about the down payment, which most people focus on that. But there's also some other ancillary things you need to pay attention to, like all the closing costs, insurance, moving expenses. But there's also a reserve requirement that most folks aren't aware of. And what I mean by that, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac require that an individual have enough money in the bank to make a down payment and three months reserves. And what that means is they take your entire projected monthly housing payment, including taxes and insurance. Whatever that number is, they, after the dust settles, after you've closed and put your money down, you know, made your down payment, they want to see you still have three months of payments in the bank so you're not exhausting all your liquid assets. That the last thing they want you to do is put every, push every penny in at the closing table, and then you have nothing to fall back on. So back to saving money. you Absolutely, if you're in the housing market, save as much money as you possibly can until you close. Once you close, then go shopping, but not, not until you close on the house because it can absolutely backfire on you. And I've seen it, unfortunately, seen that happen. So uh, next bullet point would be uh, work history. This is a big one. Um, so when you're in the middle of an application or, or, or let's say you're under contract on a property, what you don't want to do is change jobs. And it does happen, believe it or not. Um, now, you, we can work around it if, you, if your income and your occupation stay the same, we can work around that. But if you change occupations or let's say you go from W-2 employee to commission-based, that will absolutely kill the deal because now what we had was stable income. Now we have unstable income because if it's commission-based or bonus-based or anything like that, we have no idea as to what the year is going to bring for you. And so because it became unstable income, we can't use it. Therefore, it kills your deal and your deal gets declined and you lose the house. So keeping your job until you close, I cannot stress how important that is. So that's, 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 I'll get off my soapbox on that one, but if anybody has any questions, please let me know. Um, now on to uh, the don'ts. I just touched on the one don't. Don't change jobs or occupation. Uh, another one, don't take on any new debt that's not absolutely necessary. And what I mean by that is a lot of people get excited about buying furniture or appliances. yeah appliances furniture things like that for the house it's natural you don't want to do any of that you can go shop but don't buy anything because if you're taking out credit or running up your 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 debt 
we're going to calculate that again before you go to closing. And you just don't want to spend money unless it's literally absolutely necessary because it can change your credit score. It can do a whole lot of things. So I, I cannot stress that enough. You know, uh, just don't buy furniture or appliances or anything for the house until you're closed. But once you're closed, free to go do what you need to. And then lastly, I would encourage, and this is just common sense, but I got to say it. Uh, don't make any late payments on any revolving debt, any installment debt, make all monthly payments on time while you're in the uh, application process. So nothing blows back or backfires on you. Does that make sense? All right. And that, that I think wraps up my end of it. Oscar, I'll turn it back over to you, sir. Well, I guess we were actually gonna open it up to everyone. Uh, does anyone have any questions for Brian? Mortgage specific thing I can answer for you? Quiet group. Great job. Thank you. Um, Anybody need a mortgage or a refinance? We can help with that too. <laughs> so Brian, I had a question. Um, we talk about this a lot. If somebody's about to request a mortgage app, mortgage loan application, how many open trade lines should they have and what types of trade lines are you looking for? Is it revolving? Is it loans? Is it car loans? How, how do you look at that? that? Can you hear me, Brian? I think you froze up. Good question, Brenda. We don't look for anything specific. Like in other words, we're not looking for you've got to have anyone hear me? Now I can. Mm -hmm. Okay. You're you're so we aren't looking for any specific trade lines. Um uh-oh. No, can you hear me? Uh oh. Hello. You're going in and out. Okay. Okay. Can you hear me, everybody? Now I can hear you, right. but I can't see you. <laughs> yeah, we, we stopped video. Uh, hopefully that'll increase bandwidth and that way you guys can hear us. Okay. Okay, so Brenda, what I was saying is um, we don't look for anything specific uh, when it comes to trade lines. You know, there's not a number that we're looking for in terms of revolving versus installment or anything like that. So what we're really looking for is the history. We want to see uh, not a, you know, a five to 10 year history is what we're really looking for. Anything inside five years is, is that's probably going to affect your score. Uh, not, not horribly, but, you know, you're not going to get the same score that somebody that's had 25 years of good. What types of credit? That's not, it, we don't look for specifics when it comes to that. Okay. So if somebody has all credit sense? cards and, and no car loans or never had that, an installment loan, that's not something that matters? It, it's as long as they have that, the open that, credit, it's good? Yeah, the way I, that wouldn't hurt them. Okay. I feel like that's what you're asking. That yeah. would not hurt them at all. But they do have to have a history of credit, of course. Okay, awesome. There's a question in the chat from, I believe, Chris. Um, it says he's looking for advice on a hundred thousand dollar home remodel project funding. What would you recommend for that? I would say there's three different avenues you could look at. Um, my instinct would be to ask you how much equity you have in the house. Um, you could do a home equity line of credit. That's one. Uh, you could do a cash out refinance, meaning that refinance the whole loan and then pull out cash at closing and that cash goes with you into your account and you do with it what you want. Or you can do a traditional uh, second lien, a, a remodel or a home improvement second lien is what it's called. And it's, it's a true closed in loan second lien with a fixed rate specific term of 10 to 15 years. So there's really three options, but they all are built on the equity in your house at some level. So it, it, you'd have to have some equity to be able to do that. Uh, but, but the last option that I mentioned, which was the home improvement loan, 
they take a projection of what the improvements are going to be to the house and then estimate what the value of the house will be with the improvements and they use that value to calculate how much money they can give you so it is it's a it's a more forgiving loan but if you've got enough equity in your property a, a HELOC may be the best option a home equity line of credit because it's it, there's a lot of freedom in that it's your money you can pay your contractors when you want pick who you in other words you, the bank is going to give the contractors the money as they make draw requests and it's a it's a more cumbersome more expensive loan and you have less control so home equity lines of credit are really where i would start and then depending on your needs and your equity there may be a better fit for you if a home equity line is not, not the right fit. But there are options. Awesome, thank you for that. Question on the home improvement loan, because not all banks are doing those anymore. What percent of, of value will you loan up to? I know you said it goes over and above, so what percent over and above will you well, loan? Well, so TDK does not do a home improvement loan. They are out there. They're second lien companies that specialize in home improvement. Uh, TDK, we will do a home equity line of credit or we'll do a cash out refinance. Those are the two that we offer. Gotcha. Awesome. And the, re the reason specifically, the reason we, we don't offer the home improvement is because it requires a dedicated team that works with the contractors and their bid request daily. And we don't have the team or our mortgage team isn't big enough to handle that on an ongoing basis. Mm -hmm. So that's why we don't do home improvements mm -hmm. at this time. Understood, thank you for that. Um, does anybody have anything else for them? I have one other question I was gonna throw it out, out to Oscar. Does anybody else wanna ask a question? Anybody, no? Oscar, maybe you could talk to us about some unsecured lending. We do a lot of conversation, have a lot of conversations with our clients about debt reduction and consolidation loans. Um, and a lot of them, um, you know, don't know that banks offer unsecured lending and what the qualifications are. So a lot of times they end up in really bad situations and, and predatory lending. What kinds of unsecured lending do you do and what kind of um, credit scores and uh, do you look for for that? Gotcha. <clears throat> yeah, and unfortunately, you know, folks in situations where they're looking to consolidate debt and maybe they're credit scores have taken a hit or they have a couple things on their history. Um, you know, since it's unsecured, it's a higher risk loan for the bank. So we typically look for higher credit scores. So we usually start around 680 and above. Uh, and that's really, and then the loan amounts really dictated, just kind of like a mortgage based on your income and, and your current expenses. Of course, uh, you know, if we're consolidating debt, we have the option to where if we're controlling where the money goes, so at closing, after you sign your paperwork, if I'm sending a check directly to, let's say, Visa to pay off your credit card, we wouldn't uh, count that payment against you because we, we can guarantee that that loan is going to be closed and paid off. Um, but I would recommend, yeah, there, there are some legitimate companies as well. Um, I know through uh, SoFi is one of them and a couple of other lenders where they're offering pretty competitive rates. And uh, they're not as predatory. The, they don't have large origination fees. It's, it's a closed term loan. So they might put you on a one or a two year plan. My only advice for that is, you know, maybe talk to your bank or two and get some advice on what you're comfortable with. Uh, what I have seen some folks get into some hot water, they commit, they get a little ambitious on their repayment plan and maybe commit to a payment that uh, really stretches their budget. And then 90 days out, they're really in, in some tough, in a tough position. What kind of interest rates do you offer for the minimum credit score of 680 and above? They're going to vary uh, depending on the term as well, but you know those loans go anywhere between five to 11 percent, and that it, it's really based on the specific individual. Okay, those are very good rates. That's awesome. Okay, and um, auto lending. Um, do you all do the auto lending piece? We do as well. Um, and one advantage with us versus perhaps maybe a dealership, uh, if, if you're looking at a used vehicle, I know we might be able to go a little bit older than most. So if you're looking at a car for your kids and it, you know, it might be a seven or eight year old car, uh, we could still get you a favorable rate. I know at a car dealership, anything past four years, they really penalize you and you might be looking at a 15 or 17% interest rate, or we can probably get you, you know, 
at that 11% or below, hopefully. Okay. Awesome. Does anybody else want to ask any questions or you guys want to um, do any sort of a summary or anything else you'd like to add? Oscar, Brian? I'm good. I'm good. Um, I think on our last slide, if once it gets posted, our contact information is there. We're always available. If you guys have any questions, um, I know it's not always easy to ask financial stuff uh, in a public chat, uh, but if you want to speak to something privately or have a more detailed question, we're, we're available for you guys and happy to answer anything. Awesome. And we appreciate you so much taking the time to put this presentation together and to share it with us and, and answer all the questions. So we appreciate you. Thank you so much. Thank thank you. I'll go ahead and, well, guys. and thank you everyone for joining and see us again thank you. two weeks from now. Thanks, Same everyone. Time. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.